The goal of today's presentation is for educational purposes. We're very fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Justin Hilliard from the University of Florida Neurosurgery as he discusses focused ultrasound treatment as an option for patients diagnosed with essential tremor or Parkinson's disease. As questions arise during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time after the presentation to answer questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom right. Let me begin by introducing you to today's presenter, Dr. Justin Hilliard. Dr. Hilliard is a neurosurgeon at U of Health Neuromedicine Hospital in Gainesville, Florida. He is a neurosurgeon with special focus in deep brain stimulation or DBS surgery for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. Beyond DBS, he treats patients with a wide range of neurosurgical conditions, including brain tumors, spinal cord tumors, cranial trauma, and spine trauma. He graduated cum laude with a research distinction in biomedical engineering from Duke University. He received his medical degree from the University of Virginia with research honors. During his time in medical school, he was the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Medical Research Fellow. He completed both general neurosurgical training and stereotactic functional neurosurgery fellowship at the University of Florida. Welcome, Dr. Hilliard, and thank you for presenting this afternoon. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia, and good evening uh, to those in attendance. I'm <clears throat> excited to meet with you tonight and talk about uh, focused ultrasound, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about deep, deep brain stimulation as well. As uh, Marcia pointed out, um, just wanted to share a little bit about me. I, I grew up here uh, in Orlando, Florida, and uh, majored in biomedical engineering at Duke, went to medical school at the University of Virginia, and completed my neurosurgery training here at UF. And my practice is <clears throat> focused on uh, the treat neurosurgical treatment of movement disorders, such as essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, and that includes both deep brain stimulation and uh, focused ultrasound. I perform about 300 procedures a year uh, for the treatment of movement disorders. So today, uh, we're going to begin by talking a little bit about essential tremor, and then I will give an overview of focused ultrasound. We'll go through some treatment day logistics of focused ultrasound, what it looks like to have the procedure performed. I'll review some of the risks and benefits of the procedure. We'll discuss what, who a suitable individual is for focused ultrasound, what the ideal patient is for focused ultrasound. Uh, I'll compare and contrast focused ultrasound to deep brain stimulation. And I'll review uh, any questions uh, that you might have and provide answers to the best of my ability. So to begin with, I uh, want to discuss uh, essential tremor. So most of you here who are in this uh, webinar are familiar with the central tremor. It's also referred to as a familial, idiopathic, or intention tremor. And it's a tremor that typically occurs with movement of the extremities of the arms or legs and Tip, it's sometimes is present at rest, but usually that's later on in the disease course, and it's really defined by an action tremor, a tremor that occurs with movement. Some people will experience a head tremor or a vocal tremor that can also be pre present, and it affects a fair number of individuals. Uh, about 1% of the general population has a central tremor. Uh, and, and those over 60, the incidence actually increases to 5%. So one in 20 people over the age of 60 have uh, a central tremor. Generally, there's a strong familial component uh, to a central tremor. Not everybody, but about 50%, about half of patients have somebody in their family, a mother, father, first cousin, aunt, uncle, grandfather, et cetera, who has had uh, a central tremor in the past. And Thankfully, there are a number of good medical treatments for essential tremor, such as uh, propranolol, primidone, uh, tapiramate, gabapentin. And roughly about half of patients will have a response to pharmacologic options. But over the course of their disease, um, uh, many patients will, will stop their medications either from a lack of effect or from untoward side effects from the medication, like uh, feeling like they're in a brain fog or lightheadedness, uh, and so forth. What causes a central tremor is a very common question. Uh, and to answer it, I want to talk about how we create movement. So uh, you have a thought to, say, pick up a pen from your desk. Uh, your brain creates a plan for that movement. And there's another region of the brain called the cerebellum that is comparing 
your planned movement to uh, actual movement. And there are natural deviations between our planned movement and our actual movement. And as the cerebellum detects a deviation between planned and actual movement, it sends a corrective signal to a region called the thalamus uh, to improve the movement so that it is as intended. So this is the cerebellum here. You can see this sort of rear portion of the brain. It's at the base of the skull. And then the thalamus is deep within the center of the brain. And so, as I said, as we move, the cerebellum is sending information to the thalamus, correcting, providing subtle corrective inputs. But in a person with the central tremor, at the very moment where they need the most corrective action when they're doing that fine and precise movement, the cerebellum is actually selling sending an erroneous signal that to the thalamus that results in, in the tremor. So the, the cerebellum is sending uh, poor quality information that, to the thalamus that results in, in the tremor. And focused ultrasound works by using ultrasound energy to create an ablation or a little uh, impediment in the pathway from the cerebellum to the thalamus to block that erroneous information and thereby reducing uh, the tremor. And this slide shows uh, prototypical before treatment spirals and, and after treatment spirals. Um, and, and you, it's evident the improvement in tremor from that, from those two slides. During the treatment, you will lay down on the treatment bed inside the MRI scanner. The medical team will be in the control room and you will be conscious and able to communicate with them. Your head will be positioned in the focused ultrasound helmet, which is filled with water, and you will have a blanket to keep you warm. You will be given a stop sonication button if for any reason you want to stop the procedure. MR images are taken to plan the treatment. Your physician will first apply light doses of ultrasound energy to identify the right spot in your brain for treatment. Then, full intensity ultrasound energy will be applied. The treatment bed will move in and out of the MRI. After each application of ultrasound energy, you will be asked to do tasks such as drawing spirals. This is so the physician can evaluate the improvement of your tremor and any potential side effects. So that little cartoonish movie brings us to uh, explain some of the logistics of the, of the treatment, but I wanna go into it in, in more detail. Um, so you know, first you'll, the individual will arrive, the patient will arrive in the pre-procedural area and there um, we'll begin the preparations for the focus ultrasound procedure. I need to shave the head to prevent interference of the hair with the ultrasound energy. So the, you know, basically, as you saw, you're sitting in an MRI machine, there's a cap with 1,024 ultrasound, ultrasound transducers, each of which is delivering a small amount of energy. And at, a, at the target is the thalamus. Uh, as that energy is being delivered, the hair can cause the ultrasound waves to reflect in a way that's unpredictable. So it starts, I need to clip your hair uh, in the preoperative area, and then I'll apply a little frame to the head. The frame is held in place with four little pins, two in the front, two in the back. And um, those pins would hurt if it weren't for some numbing medicine that I would give you first. Now numbing medicine stings for about a minute or two each, then it's nice and numb and it feels just like you're wearing a hat that's maybe one size too tight. We then go back to the MRI area and I get you positioned on the bed, uh, the, the MRI table. The MRI table, um, I will connect the frame, which is connected to your head, directly to the bed, so you don't have to worry about holding your head still. Your arms and legs will be free and it'll get you comfortable, put some padding underneath your neck and around your legs and so forth, and get you tucked in with a blanket. And then you'll go into the MRI machine and we'll get a quick uh, scan, about 10 minutes uh, into the MRI machine. Prior to the procedure, a couple of weeks before, we will have already obtained a pre-planning MRI. I will have already created the plan before the day of uh, treatment. And so that pre-procedure MRI is a higher quality image that allows me to precisely identify the thalamus. And I'll merge that planning MRI with the, with the 10 minute image that we take. And you'll come back out. 
on the you know the tech the table slides in and out of the MRI machine. And then I'll check on you, make sure you're doing okay, and go back in and I'll deliver a small amount of energy uh, that won't have any impact yet on your tremor or any side effects. That delivery serves as a calibration step. So it ensures that where I planned on the computer is exactly where the energy is being delivered before we turn it up higher. Then I'll turn it up about to like a 50% level. And at that point, we'll begin to see a reduction in tremor. Um, and we may also ex begin to see some side effects uh, from, from the treatment. I'll explain what that represents. At this point, if that's all the energy that I were to deliver, if we were to get you off the table at that point, uh, your tremor would come back, your side effects would completely resolve. There wouldn't be any that the following day you'd be as if we had never done anything. So this step is to ensure that we're in exactly the right spot that we want to be in before we deliver the full dose of energy that creates the permanent lesion uh, that results in the tremor disruption. Our target structure in the thalamus, the motor nucleus of the thalamus is adjacent to a region of the thalamus that processes sensory information. And if I were to influence it, you may experience some numbness or tingling in your face, your hand, uh, or your leg. And so sometimes during this intermediate step where we're only applying 50% save the energy, you might experience some subtle tingling in your face, arm, leg. And if you do, then I can make an adjustment to the planning, uh, nudge up anterior, move it forward a little bit away from the sensory uh, region of the thalamus before we deliver the ultimate um, high energy dose. Once I've confirmed that we're in the location that we want to be, I'll then turn the uh, energy up to 100%. And at that point, the, the energy is delivered over about 10 to 20 seconds. You might feel a subtle headache. Um, sometimes people feel a little bit of warming of their scalp, dizziness, kind of feeling like their head over heels. These sensations are only lasting for about 10 to 20 seconds while the energy is being delivered. And you come back out of the machine for testing, making sure that uh, your tremor is resolved as, as we intend it uh, to be. So this next slide uh, goes over what I had just described. After the ultimate amount of energy is uh, delivered, I'll remove the head ring. We'll go to the recovery area for about half an hour, uh, and then you're, you go home. The next morning, we'll get a post-procedural MRI that allows us to see exactly where we had been and uh, confirms uh, our targeting and serves as a baseline for the future. I want to take a moment to show you, you know, you may be wondering, well, how big is the lesion created? What, you know, what, what does it really look like? And um, this is taken from a paper uh, from Dr. Jeff Elias. He's the pioneer of focused ultrasound in, um, at the University of Virginia. He, he led the trial that led to FDA approval of uh, focused ultrasound back in um, beginning in, in 2013. And so what we're looking at in the left hand column is before the procedure. The second column shows us one day after the procedure. And each of these rows is a different version of uh, the person's MRI. So let's focus on the second row here. And if you look second row, second column, uh, right there, you can see a little bit of the, the lesion, that little kind of white spot, different from the other side. And when you go one week out, you can see it's actually a little bit larger and then it gets smaller and smaller to the point that at three months you can you know, barely identify the anomaly. And likewise on this, in this uh, third row, you can see the size of it changing. And as time goes on at about three months, it's, it's really quite a small spot. So what does this represent? Why is it changing in size? Well, when we deliver the ultrasound energy, the brain reacts to that energy a little bit, and it has some swelling in the surrounding region. And that swelling uh, is, uh, identified by what, what has been denoted as zone two and zone three here. You can see in this illustration. So zone one is this dark center. This is the blown up portion of the MRI image that we're looking at over here. See that's zone one. Zone one is what's permanent. Zone two and three is temporary swelling that goes away with time. Now, as we deliver uh, this energy and that the swelling takes place, the, ultimately I, I only want we only want a really small lesion, a couple millimeters, that zone one to, to be permanent. Um, neighboring structures can be temporarily influenced by this swelling and can create changes in speech, swallowing, balance, 
and sensation that can last for anywhere from one to three months generally. And I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later, but just something to keep in mind and visualize here. This is just a little video of uh, before and after. Looks like it might be jerking a little bit as it's coming across there for you, but this is fairly typical. Somebody who's having a significant trouble drinking, you know, spilling from a cup and then, and then their immediate after. Hi, my name is Jody Meyer. I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I've had an essential tremor for 18 years. I am an office manager for a 911 center where I partake in a lot of meetings. The tremors in my hands comes very difficult to speak in front of the groups in the committees. Being a mother of three children, the essential tremor is becoming very, very difficult as far as preparing meals for my children, uh, putting on my daughter's makeup for her cheer competitions, pouring them a glass of milk. I struggle with that every day on how I can try to hide from people not seeing me shake as much as I do today. I would love to cuddle with my children when I'm holding them close and not thinking, are they uncomfortable because of the shaking when we're cuddling? In July of 2016, I seen that the focus ultrasound was approved by the FDA. For 18 years, I've been praying for some kind of relief and it's gonna finally become true this essential tremor is not going to rob my life anymore. When they put the clipboard up and tested how it was able to write, I, I got overwhelmed with emotions because I haven't been able to write for 18 years. Being a mother of my three children, after the procedure, I've been able to pick up a lot more daily tasks that before I used to rely on my children to do. Simple things such as uh, tying their shoes. My family was very excited. I'm able to do a lot more things, more independent, um, to be a stronger mother, or to be a stronger person. Um, I'm able to stay up to speed to make sure that all of my daily tasks are completed. I have more confidence where I'm able to join a group and have conversations. So we'll go through some numbers here in a few minutes, but you know, just qualitatively what to expect from Focus Ultrasound. It, to, Therapy that provides immediate and durable tremor improvement, an outpatient procedure. It takes about two hours. You go home the same day. Uh, there's no incision. Therefore, there's no infection risk, no general anesthesia. There's a minimal risk of hemorrhage or stroke, about one in 500. There's no maintenance or hardware uh, associated with the, with the procedure. No restrictions for future imaging. Quantitatively, when we're talking about how much tremor reduction, you look at five-year outcome data, it's about a 73% tremor improvement uh, at five years, and with a 44% improvement in, in disability. So this disability assessment is uh, essentially a survey that patients uh, filled out at, at five years, um, and they're in terms of their impact on activities of daily living and their quality of life, showing a 44% uh, improvement. That's substantial, robust, and, and, and durable. Uh, but as with everything, you know, there are pros and cons, and focused ultrasound is no different. So there are adverse events that are important to be aware of. Although this is an incisionless procedure, it's invasive. Uh, we are ablating, destroying a small portion of the brain in order to produce this tremor relief. And it can impact surrounding structures that can have untoward effects, such as uh, changes in balance, uh, walking, uh, numbness and tingling, uh, 
causing a headache at the time of the procedure. Um, I talked about changes in speech earlier that, that can also uh, take place. Generally, those would be like a subtle um, change in articulation or um, subtle word finding difficulty. Um, the, the gait disturbance, generally it's something that the person would feel a little bit off balance, uh, a little bit unsteady and, and the numbness and tingling, if it were to occur, as I mentioned earlier, would be on the same side of the body, the hand that we're treating and would be um, some, uh, sensory changes in either the face, arm or, or leg. Of all of these changes, about half resolved within a month. And many of them can be attributed to that swelling that I showed you on the MRI, the evolution that that takes over the course of, of three months. At five years, looking at, you know, the, back to that five-year outcome data, um, the persistent adverse effects or adverse events were reported to be either uh, moderate or mild, and there wasn't anything new that, that cropped up. In other words, when the procedure is finished or within a week or two of the procedure, what was experienced is, is all that is experienced. So it's not like a year later, all of a sudden you develop a new problem from, from the focused ultrasound. The most common adverse effect is, are paresthesias, which is just a fancy word, medical term for numbness and tingling. And that occur, occurs in about a fifth of, of patients. And I talked about some of the, the others, changes in speech, coordination, um, unsteadiness. If you look at um, how many of these are, are being performed globally uh, in 2022, or around 3,600 uh, focused ultrasound thalamotomies. Thalamotomy is the uh, name, the medical term for uh, creating a lesion in, in the thalamus. And so you can kind of see how it's ramped up since its FDA approval eight years ago in, in 2016. And when compared to DBS, deep brain stimulation, uh, in 2021, focused ultrasound surpassed DBS as the most common interventional procedure for a central tremor with about 1,400 uh, focused ultrasound procedures performed compared to around, uh, around 1,250 or so uh, DBS procedures. We'll talk about more, more about DBS in a minute. So who's su who is suitable for treatment for focus ultrasound? Well, uh, an individual with a confirmed diagnosis of medication refractory essential tremor. So this is not, you know, you must have undergone a trial of at least two agents before we would consider doing this uh, procedure. Again, this procedure, it's a great procedure, but it, it carries with it some risks, some of which can be permanent. And so it wouldn't make sense to, for this to be the first line thing that uh, that we do to try to control your tremor. So we will, uh, you, at least when you come or if you haven't tried yet, um, two agents, two different agents, we need to confirm that your tremor doesn't respond or that you have untoward side effects to those agents. Again, most people, I know no one likes taking medication, but um, would rather you take medication than have to go through this procedure as good as it is if the medication controls your tremor, then great. The side effect profile is, um, is, is favorable in that regard. You have to be able to tolerate laying flat within the MRI machine for two to three hours. And generally it's on the uh, lower end of that, on the hour of you know, around two hours. And it's different than when you would say, get an, just go to get a diagnostic MRI. You're not in that um, central area for two to three hours. You go in, about 10 minutes, you come out, we check on you, we're drawing spirals and so forth. So it's, um, it's not like you just go into that tube for two hours and, and then that's it. And then you come out, you're, you're kind of sliding in and out on that table. People who are not suitable for treatment are those who have non-MRI compatible implants. Um, obviously you have to be able to get an MRI to, to undergo this procedure. And then this is sort of an obscure other point called it's something called the skull density ratio. So when we're delivering the ultrasound energy, if the skull, if the density of the skull is uh, too high, then we can't turn the machine up enough to deliver enough energy to raise the temperature sufficiently to cause an ablation in the target. So 
when we're evaluating people, we get a CT scan <clears throat> beforehand. And from that, we can run a simulation and discern what the person's skull density ratio is and make sure that it's going to be in range in an appropriate range that we can deliver the amount of energy that we need to to create that that lesion about 10 percent of the population 10 to 15 percent fall out of that range and that's something again that when we see one another we'll get a ct scan that day we run it through our simulation software and within about two days we'll have an answer of uh whether the person's in that 10 to 15 percent or or in the 85 to 90 percent who's uh, within range. So many of you have probably heard about deep brain stimulation. <clears throat> I perform many deep brain stimulation procedures. It is in many ways the gold standard treatment for a central tremor, um, but it's not for everybody. And there are relative advantages and disadvantages uh, as we compare it to, to focused ultrasound. So you know, when, when I see an individual uh, come into clinic, even if they're referred for focused ultrasound, I'll talk a little bit about DBS. Likewise, if they come in for DBS, I'll talk a little bit about focused ultrasound. I want to perform the procedure that we together just decide is best for you. Um, for some people, it's clear that one is better than the other. For other people, it's a, it's a judgment call. Um, and I want to help you make that judgment uh, alongside of me uh, as we move forward. So let's talk about DBS. DBS involves placing a small wire into the same region of the brain that we target to create the ablation for focused ultrasound. So we put the DBS lead in, into the region of the thalamus. It's connected to what we describe as a pulse generator, or some people simply refer to it as a battery. And it delivers an electrical stimulus that helps to normalize that abnormal flow of information from the cerebellum to the, to the thalamus. And in so doing, by normalizing that flow of information, it helps to alleviate the tremor. The advantages of DBS are that it's, <clears throat> the stimulation is adjustable, so we can uh, turn up the stimulation as the years go on, as, essential, as the essential tremor uh, progresses. It is non-destructive, meaning that we're not destroying a portion of the brain. We're simply inserting a wire within it. It's theoretically reversible in the sense that, you know, if it's ineffective, you can remove it. That would be rare and un unusual that it would have no benefit. Um, but the theoretically, it's, uh, you know, you could take it out if need be hair sparing, so we don't shave the, the head for a DBS procedure. DBS has been around FDA approved for uh, since 1997. Um, so we have decades of experience with it. And we have sophisticated tools for, for programming it uh, that, are, that are quite familiar. So not many advantages uh, when you look at DBS, but there are also disadvantages. So it's an, it requires an inpatient surgery it typically occurs in a staged manner that can take you know, months for the full system to be implanted. So normally what this looks like is um, you have the DBS, the one side of the brain treated with the DBS lead. So we, we put a wire in one side of the brain. Then a month later, you come back and under general anesthesia, we implant the pulse generator or the battery. About a week after that, you come back to the clinic and we begin to do the uh, programming. Uh, the programming can last uh, usually about an hour in clinic. And in order to fine tune the parameters, it can take anywhere from three to six sessions that we separate out about a month uh, at a time. So we have a good idea of a combination of parameters that's likely to work, uh, that's likely to give good tremor relief, but it's probably not, you know, the first thing we set it to is probably not what's going to be absolutely what's best. And so it can take some iterations to find that optimal programming uh, parameter, which again, uh, can take a couple months to, to get there. Um, <clears throat> the, the DBS procedure obviously involves an incision, which uh, raises the risk of an infection or implanting foreign bodies into the uh, foreign material, I should say, into the body. The infection risk with DBS is about one in 30, three to 4%. Uh, and that includes both superficial infections that can be treated simply with an oral antibiotic, the deep infections that can necessitate removal of the device and prolonged IV antibiotics. The risk of stroke or hemorrhage in DBS is around one in 150. Um, obviously, we take great care to reduce that risk to zero, but 
Uh, the reality is that we're passing a physical object through the brain and um, blood vessels can be damaged that, that cause substantial impairment. And I would say relative to focused ultrasound, there's a slightly higher risk of, of speech impairments when you look at, uh, when you look at studies. Again, uh, DBS, I, I do many DBS procedures, frankly, more than, than focused ultrasound at this point. Uh, it's the gold standard, but in terms of individuals who have significant medical risk or who are simply you know, too anxious to undergo uh, a brain surgery, focused ultrasound is a good, a good alternative. So this, um, you know, this presentation is meant to give a general overview of essential tremor and, and focus ultrasound and deep brain stimulation, but you know, to really be able to individualize it uh, requires a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation. So I see that there are some questions popping up. I'll be ha happy to you know, go through those, but um, please understand that this is what I'm presenting as a generalization. And, and my goal when I see you is to really hone in on your particular risk benefit profile and help to guide you into what may be the best therapy to, to help reduce re your tremor. And so uh, I have this number up here, 352-273-9000 uh, to call to schedule an appointment to discuss uh, with me whether focus ultrasound may be your best option to treat your tremor. You know, if we meet and decide that, hey, you know, actually I think BBS would be better for you, the DBS evaluation process is a little bit more involved. It, it includes individuals in other disciplines beyond me that I will get you set up with uh, after that initial conversation with me, and we can go through that. Uh, but sort of the next step to get more information is to call that number and, and get an appointment scheduled with me. In terms of what to expect at that appointment or on that day, we'll, as I pointed out, we'll obtain a CT of the head to evaluate the skull density ratio. And then we'll meet in clinic at the Fixel Institute um, and have a good discussion. I'll perform a, you know, kind of at, talk to you about your, your tremor, when did it begin, uh, what things are most impacted, what medications have you tried, what other therapies have you tried. Um, then I'll take you again through a, a hypothetical focused ultrasound procedure. We we'll talk a little bit about DBS. And then, um, I'll run that CT scan uh, through our simulation software, as I pointed out. And in a day or two thereafter, we'll know uh, if the skull density ratio looks good or not. And if an appropriate candidate and you want to move forward with focused ultrasound, we'll obtain a planning MRI of the brain about two weeks prior to the procedure date. My goal is to uh, get the procedure scheduled within four to six weeks after that initial clinic visit or, or later if, if desired, if that uh, works better with your with your schedule. So at this point, I will uh, leave this number up for you, and I'm going to pull up the questions and uh, begin going through them. Um, so one person asks, <clears throat> how can you tell the difference between having essential tremors and Parkinson's disease? So this is a distinction that uh, is generally made uh, based on neurologic exam. As I said, essential tremor is typically only is typically most prominent when the individual is performing an action. Parkinson's disease tremor is classically one that is uh, present at rest, and they have different uh, features that sort of a different look to them. Another uh, mechanism to differentiate is by prescribing different medications. So typically, a Parkinson's tremor will respond to a medication that, a, that an essential tremor tremor 
would not. Um, that's something that we can discuss and or that, you know, usually neurologists who are making referrals uh, already have, a, have, have made the diagnosis and made a good um, have, have clarity into. All right, the next question here, sedation, conscious sedation or general anesthesia. Uh, with focused ultrasound, there's no sedation, no conscious sedation, no general anesthesia. So everything is under a local anesthetic. I give you a little bit of numbing medicine at the four points where the frame attaches uh, to the skull. Next question is, can you perform the procedure bilaterally on, on both sides to, to treat both hands? And um, the answer is yes, you may. Uh, both DBS and focus ultrasound have FDA labeling for bilateral treatment. Um, however, we always perform the second side in a delayed fashion. So the FDA labeling for focus ultrasound is to perform the second side uh, at least nine months after the first side. Part of that is to allow, remember that brain swelling that I mentioned to you to uh, completely resolve. Oftentimes the untreated side of the brain will take over, if you will, or compensate in part for some of the uh, negative ramifications of that swelling in terms of you know, swallowing and balanced speech. So if you were to lesion both sides in one setting, uh, you'd likely really be thrown for a loop in terms of, of your recovery. Uh, same person asks, you sometimes apply the ultrasound beam to the cerebellum or is it always to the thalamus? The answer is it's always to the thalamus. That's where the uh, highest density of information is flowing from the cerebellum and where you can uh, most specifically impact the um, uh, impaired information. Somebody asks whether there's Medicare approval for focused ultrasound. Uh, Yes, for a central tremor, there is. And, um, you know, as you move through the course of evaluation, we have a financial representative that can um, interface with you and so that you have a, a good sense of what your responsibility might be for the procedure. But the, the general answer is yes. Uh, does age factor into the decision of which intervention to choose? Um, it does, uh, in the sense that those who are older are going to be generally have uh, additional medical comorbidities that might push you toward focused ultrasound. So I think that, you know, one area that focused ultrasound really shines is in older people, like people in their eighties, a lot more comfortable uh, performing focused ultrasound on that age group than I might be DBS. When you look at studies that assess DBS's, or excuse me, focused ultrasound's impact on cognition, uh, the studies have shown that there's no significant change in, in cognition. Uh, and that's one of the bigger risk factors for uh, elderly individuals. Um, can a person with a cardiac pacemaker have the procedure? It depends on the model. This person uh, actually listed the model, but I don't know off the top of my head their particular model, whether it's MRI compatible. If the, pa if the cardiac pacemaker is MRI compatible, then you should be able to have the focus ultrasound uh, procedure. But that, that kind of gets really specific. And we'd have to go over that, um, you know, in particular with you. Can any neurologist diagnose a person with a central tremor or should I be seeking a specialist? Thanks. Uh, well, any neurologist should be able to diagnose a person with a central tremor. Um, you know, a central tremor is generally pretty cut, cut and dry. I'm not a neurologist. Uh, I'm a neurosurgeon. So, uh, but however, as I began at the beginning saying, I have special training in the branch of movement disorders. However, so when I see you, you know, I'm fairly comfortable myself being able to be confident that something is a central tremor versus not a central tremor. And if I have any question, then I would uh, have you seen, I would request that you would be seen by my movement disorder neurology colleagues who are at the Fixell Institute. To, to clarify, but generally it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, somebody else is asking here, do you coordinate with any other major university related hospitals in the United States who are performing focus ultrasound? I don't live near Florida. <clears throat> um, I'm not, I, I guess the best answer to this question is there are uh, about 80 centers in the United States, I believe at this point, um, who are performing focus ultrasound. And so if you search online for it, you should be able to find a, a local or uh, regional entity that, that's performing the procedure. And you should be able to uh, find that without 
without issue. Um, somebody else asked, is this covered by insurance? Uh, broadly speaking, yes. Again, you know, your individual insurer may vary, but for essential tremor, again, it's this has been FDA approved since 2016. There's solid evidence for it. It's, it's not controversial. It's not investigational. And so most insurance companies at this point uh, are, are covering it. Um, somebody asks, do you know of any focused ultrasound clinical trials for orthostatic tremor? <clears throat> None that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. If you go to clinical trial, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, this is an online registry uh, through which any of us who are performing clinical trials uh, have to have to register. And I, what my recommendation would just be to perform a quick search, focus ultrasound or orthostatic tremor uh, for you to see, but none, none here at UF. Is there a cutoff age? Uh, my essential tremor has gotten worse over a long period of years, 40, will it continue to progress? There is no cutoff age. Um, there, it, there's no specific cutoff age. You know, again, every interaction here is, um, uh, designed to be personalized. And, um, you know, this procedure has been even performed on people in their nineties. A central tremor, unfortunately, is a progressive degenerative disease. And it, it by definition, it does worsen over time. Um, one might ask, well, when is an appropriate time to seek this kind of treatment? And the answer is, when medications are no longer effective and it's significantly impairing your quality of life, at that point, generally, the risk benefit favors intervention. But again, it's, it's very specific to the individual. So it, it's hard to make a, a general statement on this. How many appointments do you come to before finalizing or scheduling the procedure? So uh, for focused ultrasound, if you call that number, uh, they'll direct you to a representative within the neurosurgery department. Uh, that person will generally call you back within a day or two and give you a proposed date. If that doesn't work for you, choose another date. Um, but on, on that date, you will meet with me in clinic and you will get a CT scan of, of your head. So that's one appointment. If, we, if your skull density ratio is within range and we determine that together, we determine that, hey, this is something that you want to do, then we will schedule a pre-planning MRI. That takes place roughly about two weeks before the procedure date. So that's appointment two. Then there's the day of the procedure. That's around day three. And then uh, the day after the procedure, we get an MRI. So most people, like if they're coming from out of town, they'll just spend the night in a hotel on the day, you know, the, the day of the procedure after it's taken place, stay at the night of the hotel, get their post-procedural MRI the next morning, and then, and then go home. So appointment with me and CT on, on one day, pre-procedural MRI on another day, and then the day of the procedure with the MRI uh, following that. The reason I don't get the, I don't get the pre-planning MRI on the day of our initial evaluation, because it's, um, you know, it's about an hour long scan. And if we end up deciding that, Hey, this isn't, the, the best thing for you, or if we discern that to determine that your skull density ratio is out of range, it's kind of a waste of your time, money, and so forth. And so I've kind of split that up into a separate date. And I know depending on where you live, that uh, you know creates a logistical challenge for some people. But overall, I think it's uh, what's best. Does one have to have bilateral treatment? I'm right-handed and would be satisfied for controlling a central tremor there. No. Uh, the answer to your question is no, people do not have to have bilateral treatment. And in fact, uh, depending on the person's individual risk factors, I'll often counsel them that I think that we should just stop after one side. <clears throat> you know, again, there are risks to this procedure, speech, swallowing, balance, um, and, you know, sensory changes. And if we get through one side, your dominant hand, and, you know, your tremors rock steady, and you don't have any adverse event any of those adverse effects and, um, you know, you're in your late seventies or, or eighties, it probably doesn't make sense to push it and do the other side only to cause a, you know, a problem with your balance where now you're having to use a cane or a walker or something like that. So, um, it, you know, again, it's a, it's an individual conversation. You certainly are not obliged to have both sides treated. Somebody asked, is it possible to grow out of tremor? Uh, well, 
for a central tremor, a central tremor, again, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. So it's not one that is going to revert on its own accord. And uh, there's no other form of tremor that I'm aware of that gets better on its, on its own or that one would grow out of. Is hair required to be shaved for the procedure? Yes, for focused ultrasound, the entire head is shaved. Hair can interfere with the ultrasound waves. Um, and so it needs to be completely shaved. And I will shave it on the day of the procedure. You don't have to worry about that. The, your hair will grow back. Um, what age range does essential tremor onset typically? Well, it frankly, it varies. There is not a really typical answer there. It, uh, many patients will go all the way back to grade school and say that they noticed a subtle tremor, but most commonly it doesn't begin to really significantly impact people in a way that it disturbs their quality of life until their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and you know, the onset, again, it can be anywhere from even you know teenage or even pre-teenage years, generally to the, someone's 50s is the typical onset, I suppose, but there's, a, there's really a wide range. Hey, Dr. Hilliard, we had a question that came in before you um, started even, and it said, um, I investigated surgical interventions, but decided against it because I'm a high risk. I'm a high risk of falls. Is my understanding that essential tremor treatment with focus ultrasound would affect that? Should I, something I should explore? Yes. Yeah, so both deep brain stimulation, which is what I believe this questioner was alluding to in terms of surgical intervention and focused ultrasound can both impact gait and balance. And so, uh, you know, depending on the level of impairment that one is beginning with in terms of gait or balance will kind of depend on the appropriateness of, of either procedure. You know, generally with either one, <clears throat> gait may have a slight detriment, but it, it's uncommon to go from, hey, I'm walking to I can't walk or, Hey, I'm walking to, Oh, I need a walker now more. So it would be, for example, somebody notices that um, you know, they're a little off balance or sometimes if it falls and now they have to be like extra careful because they're a little bit more off balance. And maybe before they would just use a cane when they were going out to a store and now they're using a cane, you know, most of the time, for example, um, that that's how I would put it. But again, I really need to, talk about it on, at an individual level to give a good answer to that question. Hey, well, I really appreciate everybody uh, coming out tonight. Um, you know, I, I have uh, a real heart for the treatment of a central tremor. I appreciate people. Um, I've, I've been inspired by patients that I've seen over many years who persevere with this disease. And I'm thankful that we have both deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound to offer to to, to treat um, individuals and really, in some ways, um, kind of give, uh, restore quality of life and, and, and give people function back in a way that is difficult to overstate. You know, in, in this presentation, there have been, you know, some videos that uh, look phenomenal. And it's true that there's, there, you know, there's mar marketing videos, but they really are uh, a common outcome, not cherry picked. You know, you could take any person uh, that we're doing this procedure on and, and look at them afterwards. And this would be, you know, a common outcome that they would be, that they would be seeing in terms of tremor, tremor reduction. Uh, it's hard to overstate the impact that it, either of these therapies have. Uh, two last questions here coming in. Uh, is it an absolute that tremor must be refractory to medication trials to be eligible for focused ultrasound? Um, well, yes. I mean, in order, it, it wouldn't make sense to do focused ultrasound if medications were substantially helping tremor. Now, what does it mean to be refractory? I think maybe a better or, or really like uh, the detail that we have to answer. So when I say refractory, <clears throat> I mean that either the tremor is not controlled to satisfaction. In other words, the tremor is still impairing one's quality of life or that the person is having untoward side effects from the medication, whether that be a brain frog, excuse me, brain fog, uh, or um, lightheadedness, you know, low blood pressure, et cetera. Refractory doesn't mean that it doesn't, that the medicine doesn't work at all. Most patients will say, oh yeah, it helps a little bit, 
but not nearly enough. Um, and, and so that's what we mean by, by refractory. I have Parkinson's disease can focus ultrasound help. Oh, excuse me, I have Parkinson's tremor can focus ultrasound help. So this is something that I, I, I really didn't address during this webinar. <clears throat> uh, the answer is focus ultrasound can be used for the treatment of tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. But in general, I think it's an inferior therapy to DBS, which is why I don't highlight it as much. Now, Parkinson's tremor is um, fluctuates in, in ways that are different than a central tremor. And DBS provides, I think, a more even consistent response. There's varied opinions on this. Um, but that's my opinion at this point in time. How does UF Health diagnose a central tremor? Do you know what an appointment or series of appointments entail? So, you know, if you call this number that I have on the screen, you know, we we'll get an appointment and you'll you'll see me. Um, however, if you see me and you haven't really tried any medications yet, I don't want to say it's a waste of time, but I'm going to recapitulate a lot of what I just said. And so, my advice to you would be first to see your primary care doctor. Uh, and have them trial you on one on on one or two uh, medications like primidone or propranolol, and see how what kind of response you have. Hopefully it's good, and hopefully it's you don't need to see me. You know, hopefully it's a robust response, and that's it. But if it's either not robust or it doesn't last, or you have side effects, then after you've uh, tried those medications, then you could see me, and we could. It would talk about whether focus social sound makes sense. To, to you, most primary care doctors can diagnose a central tremor. Like I said earlier, it's a pretty cut and dry neurologic disease. It's common. Um, it's not like a zebra out there that that doctors in, in the primary care field don't see very often. So I would start with your primary care doctor if that's not somebody who you trust or feel like um, can adequately make a diagnosis. Um, then you can see one of the you can see a, a neurologist uh, here at at Fixel, um, and to to make that appointment, it, it would be a different number. I guess you could call the number that's on the screen, and then we can redirect you to the to the neurology side of things. But if you if you're if you're uncertain or you just want to talk to me, it's not a big deal. I'm not. I don't. Yeah, you know, I've. I would rather people come and see me and you're not quite ready for focused ultrasound, then you get lost in the, you know, um, trying to figure out who to go to. I'm not going to be upset. I'm going to help guide you. We'll have a conversation. And, you know, if it's not, if it's not, if it's not your time to get it or you're not appropriate for it, I can help, help guide you through it. All right. I don't see any other questions. Again, I appreciate you guys. Uh, Marsha, thanks for your help uh, hosting this and, um, you've got that number on the screen. You just give it.